Good morning, and welcome to worship here at the People's Church. We are so delighted to have you with us on this lovely Sunday. Uh, it is a very special Sunday for us because this is the Sunday where we have the Henry and Annabelle Larzelier Memorial Lecture Series, uh, and that person who is going to be speaking with us this afternoon, Amanda Tyler, is going to be our guest preacher today. So we are delighted to have Amanda Tyler offering a message for the day. And we hope that whenever you are listening or watching this service, that you sense the Spirit of God moving in our midst as we are together this day. We are delighted to have you with us, and there are just a couple of announcements we want to lift up. A reminder that November 1st, that's next Sunday, is going to be celebrated as All Saints Sunday here at the People's Church. We will have candles, we will be reading the names of those who have died in the last year and tolling the bell in memory of those saints that have gone on. So if you have a name of a loved one, someone that you would like included in the roles, we encourage you to let us know and to send that to the church, either call and leave a message or send an email. So join us in making All Saints Sunday a very meaningful one. A couple of other announcements. Of course, uh, Amanda Tyler is with us today and she's going to be offering the lecture this afternoon, which will be from one to three, and the information on how to access that Zoom lecture is posted in the bulletin. There is a meeting ID for the Zoom event and also a password. And so we're hoping that as many people as possible will join us for this exciting lecture series. Um, her talk is about Christian citizenship in 2020, a very pertinent conversation for this day. A couple of other announcements uh, to let you know what's going on with the church. We do want to let you know that we are having a holiday food basket program, and if you'd like to make donations to that, there is a link in the bulletin. Uh, we're going to try and put together 30 food baskets to those in need. Also a reminder that we continue to have virtual groups meeting. Uh, there's the Wednesday Bible study and the Monday morning Bible study and the Tuesday men's group. So if you'd like to participate in any of those, please let us know. Uh, information is in the bulletin and you can access those Zoom meetings in that way. There are other announcements uh, in the bulletin and we trust that you will get a chance to look at them. If you have any questions, please contact the church and we know that you will, of course, uh, get an answer to any questions you have once we hear from you. So now I invite you to join me in a spirit of reverence. Let us come before God and join in the call to worship. Children of God, gather together and join in worship. The Holy One draws near. Setting aside all distractions, we will listen for God's voice. What does the Lord have to teach us? Day after day, God calls us to faith. God's commandments are right and righteous. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us give thanks and praise the Lord. Children of God, rejoice and give thanks. We will rejoice and give thanks to the Lord. Our opening hymn is number 63. Let us join together in our singing.
And now, my brothers and sisters, having come into God's gracious presence, I now invite you to join me in setting down all that separates us from God. Let us join together in the prayer of confession. God of grace, have mercy upon us as we make our confession. So often what we preach is not what we practice. We ourselves do not bear the burdens we impose on others. Our compassion is finite and our forgiveness is conditional. We value pleasure above the needs of others. We pretend not to hear the cries of the oppressed. O oh God, forgive our craving for comfort and security. Help us to embody the bold love of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen. My brothers and sisters, all you saints, hear the news which we always proclaim to the world, and that is that those who confess their sins find complete forgiveness in God's steadfast love. Therefore, in this moment, know that you are loved and believe that you are forgiven. Let us join together in the response. And now, even though we are virtual in this moment, it's our opportunity to reach out and to greet one another and pass the peace. So however you care to do that, that is the time. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us pass the peace.
A reading from Scripture. This morning we're reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Let us listen for a word from the Lord. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. The devil then led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil led him to Jerusalem and took him high up on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all these temptations, he left Jesus until a more opportune time. Jesus then returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. Here ends our reading from scripture. May God add understanding to our hearing of this word. And now I have the great pleasure to introduce to you, my virtual congregation, our preacher for today. Today we are blessed to have Amanda Tyler bring us a word. Amanda is the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee in Washington, D.C. If you're unfamiliar with the BJC, it was founded in 1936, and it is committed to the protection of religious liberty, furthering the principle that religion must be freely exercised, neither advanced nor inhibited by government. It's also worthy of noting that the BJC is the only faith-based group working on a national level to ensure that every American has the right to follow his or her religious beliefs. Amanda Tyler has been called a powerful advocate, a rising star by the Nonprofit Times, and she was named one of the nation's top 50 nonprofit leaders in 2018. In 2019, Amanda Tyler was named Baptist of the Year by EthicsDaily.com for her work leading the Christians Against Christian Nationalism campaign, and that will be part of the subject of her conversation and sermon for the day. We are so delighted to have Amanda Tyler bring us a message, and we wait with bated breath to see what she has to say about Matthew, and Christian citizenship in 2020. So we welcome to the People's Church, Amanda Tyler. Good morning to you, the People's Church. I'm so grateful to be joining you this week. Though we'd hoped it would be in person, we have this wonderful technology to make this week's gathering and time together safe for all. 
I wanted to say a special thank you to Dr. Monroe and to Marianne Larzer-Lear and everyone else who invited me to deliver the Henry and Annabelle Larzer-Lear Memorial Lecture this year. I'm looking forward to being with you live this afternoon for more conversation together. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Our gospel lesson this morning starts in the first 13 verses with a story that's told not just in Luke's gospel, but also in Matthew and in Mark. We know it usually as the temptation of Christ. In this story, we see the unique nature of Jesus as fully human and yet fully divine. Temptation, of course, is a part of the human experience. I wonder if Jesus was remembering these 40 days when he taught us his prayer, lead us not into temptation. But we can go all the way back to the Genesis story, to those first humans who were tempted to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they failed. During the Exodus, the Israelites were tempted to worship other gods as they wandered in the desert for 40 years, and they failed. We are all stiff-necked people. We will be tempted, and we will often fail. Here in Luke's gospel, Jesus is tempted as we are, but unlike we would likely do, he passes each test, and that's where we can see his divinity and his humanity together. Jesus is tested here in three ways, to satisfy his hunger by performing a miracle, to achieve world domination by promising his loyalty to the devil, and to prove his, div his divinity by testing God. I want to focus particularly on the second test here because I think it has special relevance to some of the temptations that we face today. In the gospel, Jesus is promised all the kingdoms of the world, their glory and all the authority. Jesus can have it all. All he has to do is worship the devil and acknowledge the devil's lordship. But Jesus... God incarnate in a Jewish human body rejects the easy way out, and he quotes from the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy. It's a text he probably knew well. It's the same chapter that the Israelites were to recite to their children, talk about when they were at home and away, when they lie down and when they wake up. They were instructed to bind this text as a sign on their hand, as an emblem on their forehead, to write it on the doorposts of their homes and their gates. Jesus, a student of the Torah, is clear about his allegiance. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name alone you shall swear. I wanted to dwell on this scripture today because it is so relevant to our days. We live in a time when our kingdoms are very confused. Everywhere we turn as Americans, it feels like we are being promised we can have it all. But the source is very rarely, if ever, the Lord our God. Instead, it's our country, our hard work, our grit, ourselves. Don't get me wrong, I don't think that patriotism or personal industry or capitalism are evil. I just think we can get confused and start to serve country, the market, or even ourselves before our God. Jesus, later in his ministry, warns us about confusing our kingdom allegiances. Do you remember another time when he's put to the test, this time by the Pharisees and the Herodians? They ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Say yes, and he'd ruin his credibility with the Jewish people. Say no, and the Romans could charge him with treason. But Jesus, aware of their malice, according to Matthew's gospel, had the perfect answer, and he made them give it to him. He asked for someone to bring him a coin and asked, whose head is this? 
the emperor. And then Jesus said, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. Of course, this was more than just an answer to the question of a tax obligation. It gets to the heart of the tension we find ourselves in. Citizens of two kingdoms, earthly ruled by governments, and God's kingdom, which claims a higher citizenship. We are children of God who have chosen to follow Christ and call ourselves Christian. We are also citizens of the United States of America and therefore call ourselves Americans. Jesus tells us that we have to work out our allegiances to God and to Caesar, determining what to render to which. How do we navigate this dual citizenship? For one, we can be sure that our heads of state, so to speak, don't get confused. Fortunately for us as Americans, the U.S. Constitution set up a system to separate the institutions of church and state. Now, this concept of church, separation of church and state has never meant, nor should it mean, a divorcement of religion or religious people from public life. Far from it. But it does mean that the institutional church should refuse to be controlled by or get too cozy with the institutions of state. Also, it means that the state should tr not try to do the job of the church, and the church should not try to do the job of the state. We can also push back from attempts to conflate our identity as Americans with our identity as Christians. Note that one citizenship status does not necessarily lead to another. To state the obvious, not all Christians are Americans, not all Americans are Christians. But we live in a time when stating the obvious seems increasingly necessary. Necessary because we live in a time when a political ideology and cultural framework that merges Christian and American identities is on the rise. Christian nationalism is not new. The myth that the United States was founded as a Christian nation has been around for decades. But now that stream of thought is front and center. Christian nationalism manifests itself in various ways these days. Calls for In God We Trust posters at public schools. Christian prayers at town meetings. Calls for Bible literacy, but not religious literacy in public schools. Public religious displays and other ceremonial religious expressions. Some might say that these examples are harmless and indeed constitutional. After all, we have examples from early American history of presidents giving religious invocations. Congress begins its sessions with prayer. In God We Trust has been a national motto since the 1950s. But setting aside this morning the history, which is mixed, and the constitutional cases, which are highly fact-specific, I do not think that these practices and particularly the recent push to expand even more in this area, are harmless. Christian nationalism creates in-groups of Christians and out-groups of everyone else. It harms religious liberty by tending to make those who are not Christian into second-class citizens, perhaps not explicitly, but at least implicitly, when the state tends to show favor for a particular religious tradition. But the harms are not only for Americans who are religious minorities or for the growing number of Americans who don't claim a specific religious tradition. Christian nationalism is also harmful to people like me who claim the Christian faith and our attempts to follow Christ. That's because Christian nationalism confuses our allegiances. Christian nationalism tempts us to become political power brokers to have it all by worshiping something other than the Lord our God. But what do we lose when we make a deal with the devil, when we align ourselves with the principalities of power rather than act as prophets for gospel truth? I lead the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, or BJC. We at BJC have been learning more about Christian nationalism and how it shows up in our society, not just now, but historically as well. 
I hosted a 10-part podcast series for the BJC podcast on Christian nationalism. And as part of that series, I talked with Old Testament scholar and theologian Walter Brueggemann about Christian nationalism and theology. I asked him about the dangers of being political power brokers. And he answered, when our claims for gospel truth are attached to a political and economic power, they are ineffably distorted and designed to maintain the privilege of the status quo. Being aligned with power, he said, has a very seductive way of being talked out of the critical edge of the gospel. So what does that look like? In another podcast episode, I had a conversation with Jamar Tisby, who's written a powerful and difficult book called The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity in Racism. In his book and in our conversation, Tisby recounted the history of slave codes, of how race-based slavery became legal in what would become the United States, a legal history that goes all the way back to 1667 in the assembly in the colony of Virginia. Virginia was an Anglican colony, and the assembly was composed of white Anglican men. Race-based chattel slavery had been in Virginia at this point for decades, but the Anglican church was also very busy baptizing new believers. And here, the power of the state and the power of the church were coming into conflict. So what did those religious leaders, who were also political leaders, choose? Tisby notes, they passed a law that said baptism would not free an enslaved Native American, person of African descent, or mixed-race background. They sacrificed their theology in favor of their desire to hold on to political power, a choice that came at the expense of human beings. They chose to be oppressors rather than liberators. It's a choice, of course, that the church in power would continue to make for hundreds of years to come, to align themselves with the status quo, to hold on to power, no matter what that meant for their neighbors, to turn a blind eye, and in some cases, to even attempt to justify slavery and Jim Crow segregation on theological grounds. On a September Sunday morning 57 years ago, Four girls were killed at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Denise McNair, and Carol Robertson were in Sunday school when a bomb detonated on the east side of the church, spraying mortar and bricks from the church's front and caving in its interior walls. Jamar Tisby chose the image of the girls' funeral for the cover of his book. And he opens with the story of a white lawyer named Charles Morgan Jr. After the bombing, Morgan stood up in front of an all-white business club in Birmingham and asked who was responsible for throwing that bomb. And then he answered his own question. We all did it. By failing to confront racism in its everyday mundane forms, Tisby says, Morgan was getting at, they created a context of compromise that allowed for an extreme act of racial terror like planting dynamite at a church. They chose to be complicit rather than courageous. It's a choice that's still there for the church to make today, to be on the side of the status quo or to be on the side of justice, to be a power broker or to be a prophet to hold on to religious privilege, or to defend our neighbor's religious liberty as we would our own. Jesus, of course, made a choice in the desert. Faced with the devil's offer for world domination and power, he passed. He rejected the devil's offer because it was too good to be true. And then he set out on his ministry. In just a few verses, he preaches his first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth. Talk about a fall from grace, at least by worldly standards. He goes from the top of the world 
to a backwater town, a place that's best known by the famous sarcastic quip from John's Gospel, has anything good ever come out of Nazareth? But it's just like Jesus to surprise us this way. He's not top down, but bottom up. He came to upset the order of things, making the last first and the first last. Jesus is more interested in truth than power. He chooses to be a prophet rather than a power broker. So how appropriate that when he arrives in Nazareth and goes to the synagogue and stands to read that the scroll that is handed to him is from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In our conversation for the podcast, Dr. Brueggemann described oppression as the direct and active violation of the commandment that we should love our neighbor. So Jesus' first sermon could really be summed up in three words, love your neighbor. This choice that Jesus made in the desert to pursue God's kingdom over the earthly empire was not easy. It ultimately cost him his human life as it gained him eternal life. It's the good news of Easter after Good Friday. Dr. Brueggemann said it so poignantly in our conversation. What the crucifixion resurrection narrative bears witness to is that the presumption of any nation or any empire has its limits and finally cannot defeat God's intention for an alternative way in the world. The confession of Easter is pivotal for political practice in the world because it says that God's will for life and for well-being is the truth of the world. And when we sign on for that, we sign on for all kinds of possibility that the nation or the empire does not want to entertain. It's a bold confession, and one that we who call ourselves Christians are trying to live into each and every day. We don't walk alone, and neither did Jesus. Did you notice in the gospel that at three times we are reminded that the Holy Spirit was with Jesus, first in the desert, and then when he returned to Galilee, and finally when he preached in Nazareth. And so we pray for the Spirit's presence in our life and for our God to lead us not into temptation, the temptation to confuse God and country, the temptation to confuse our American citizenship with our citizenship in the kingdom of God, the temptation to try to save religious privilege and lose religious liberty in the process, the temptation to worship success over worshiping and serving God, the temptation to choose being a power broker over a prophet. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Amanda Tyler. That was a wonderful message. And now I invite you all to join us in our hymn, which is number 200, 729, verses 1 and 2. Let us join together.
And now, my friends, I invite you to enter into a spirit of prayer as we come before God in this time. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, in your presence, in your light, we see ourselves as we are. We are broken and blessed. We are flawed and fabulous. We are saints and sinners. Help us to always be humble, humble enough to recognize our errors and hopeful enough to see our lives as a place where you can be present and do your work. We pray for your strength, for your courage, for your healing, for your presence. We pray for you to be with those who are sick, whether it's in mind or body or spirit. Wherever there are people who struggle with illness, we pray for your light and your healing. We pray for people who have lost loved ones and for those who are moving from this life to the next life. Draw near to those who come to the end of this mortal life. Draw especially close to those they leave behind. For anyone who is in a time of mourning, O oh God, bring comfort and consolation. This morning we pray for people who are lost, who are afraid, who are going down roads that do not lead to you. We ask for you to search out all your lost sheep. Do not lose one, instead bring us all closer to you. Offer those who are lost your guidance, your strength, your light, and your presence. We pray for this world, this world that is full of toil and tumult. We pray for this world that is full of worries and trials and anxiety. Help us to always rest in you. Bless us with your spirit of contentment and peace. And never let us be so anxious about our own faith that we are moved to impose our beliefs on others. Help us day by day, O oh God, to be your children of faith. May we walk with Jesus and follow in all his ways. It is Jesus who invites us to pray together the words he taught to the disciples, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to the time of gathering the Lord's offering together. This is usually when we would have a new video from our stewardship team, but due to some scheduling problems, that video is not ready to premiere on this Sunday, October 25th, but watch for it to drop, as they say, soon, maybe later today, probably on Monday. So instead of seeing a stewardship video, I would simply remind you of what you already know, that this is a wonderful congregation that day in, day out, is acting as the body of Christ in this place and this time. We cannot do it alone. We need everybody's gifts, and that includes financial gifts. So my friends, however you choose to give, the Lord's offering will now be received.
I now invite you to join me in the prayer of dedication. Almighty God, we dedicate this offering to your reconciling work. Bless these gifts and enhance our ministry. May we use all our talents to love our neighbors and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. I would now invite you to join me in singing our final hymn. It's number 766. Let us sing together. And now my friends receive this blessing and this commission. Let us go from this time of worship refreshed, knowing that God's spirit has been with us. Let us enter into the world with a heart full of Christ's love and let us share what we have with those in need. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.